So again, I'm Mary Dillon. I'm the chair of the Economic Club of Chicago, and I am so delighted to have here today Chris Kempinski, president and CEO of the McDonald's Corporation. You know, just as in a couple of asides, it's, uh, it's just an honor for me to have this event with Chris today because McDonald's is obviously an iconic, iconic global company based right here in Chicago. I spent a few years of my own career at McDonald's. Chris is a fantastic leader, so there's so much for us to talk about. We also have a special guest at our head table today, somebody who's been a mentor for both Chris and I, the Chairman Emeritus of McDonald's, Andy McKenna. So. And I, and I know Andy's mentored many people in this room, as you often point out to me. So it's not just about us. All right. Well, after we hear some brief remarks from Chris, then I'll come back up and we'll do a little, uh, a little conversation. So stepping back, I'm not sure most of you are aware of this, but Chris, his first job was as a dishwasher, not just at home, a paid dishwasher. When he was 16 years old, he worked at First Watch, which was known for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in Cincinnati, Ohio. Kind of wild when you think about where he is today. Now, I think he must have been pretty good at his job because it served him very well for his future, working for some of the largest global consumer companies. Chris was born and raised in Cincinnati. His mom was a teacher, and his father was a prominent professor and surgeon who also was wheelchair bound. And that gave Chris an early understanding of the need for accessibility and, and inclusion. After he earned his BA at Duke University, his wife, Heather, is also an alum, and I understand both of his kids are currently enrolled as well. Chris began his career at Procter & Gamble in brand management, the place to start in brand management, right? Selling soap, which he probably knew a little bit about from his dishwasher days. Um, <laughs> perfect training for him, and then he went on to get his MBA at Harvard. Chris then went on to the Boston Consulting Group, where he worked in consumer products and pharmaceuticals. He's had stints at PepsiCo and Kraft, and then he followed uh, after that, joining the strategy group at McDonald's in 2015. And just one year later, he was named president of McDonald's US, overseeing 14,000 restaurants. Chris was elevated to president and CEO in 2019. He now leads 200,000 employees, which is all about driving McDonald's growth strategy, accelerating the arches. And he ensures that the company's values and purpose, which is to feed and foster community, are embedded in all of McDonald's decision making. Now, under his leadership, McDonald's 2021 global sales surpassed 120, 112 billion, with the stock price up 21%. Great performance, Chris. Keep it up. Chris's tenure has also coincided with unprecedented challenges for Chicago, from civil unrest and escalating crime to economic inequality, and a perception that McDonald's headquartered city here is not a friendly place to do business. For more on what makes McDonald's such a homegrown success, and what role McDonald's and corporate Chicago can play in the future of our city, please welcome McDonald's president and CEO, Chris Kinchinski. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for your introduction. Uh, let me start out by saying what an honor it is for me to be here speaking with the Economic Club. I, I said to David, you know, he asked, well, why are you here uh, to talk about the Economic Club, to talk at the Economic Club uh, on this topic versus the other outlets? And I said, well, in my mind, the Economic Club uh, is really the premier institution in this city uh, to have the sort of dialogue and the discussion that we're going to have here uh, today. Uh, the Economic Club, as all of you know, has, has for decades brought together uh, business leaders, civic leaders, and engaged in conversations that were timely and of the moment, and that's uh, what we have uh, in store for today. There's a lot going on in the city of Chicago, uh, and I want to talk to and, and reflect on some of that. Uh, but before I do, uh, I also just want to recognize and thank uh, a few people here, and it starts with uh, our McDonald's uh, team members. We like to call ourselves the McFamily, so I want to recognize a few members of our McFamily uh, who are here uh, today, starting with our table here in the front, a number of uh, members of my team uh, who are joining us here uh, in person. Uh, it wasn't mandatory requirement that they come here. <laughs> They volunteered, I promise you, uh, they volunteered, uh, not voluntold. But in any event, uh, thank you uh, for coming, uh, and great to have your guys' support here. Also, Mary acknowledged Andy, but I just want to acknowledge Andy, or as I like to call him, Mr. Chicago. Uh, everywhere I go, uh, people know Andy McKenna and know what he has done. 
uh, and meant for Chicago. And at McDonald's, he was chair of our board for over a decade. He's now chairman emeritus. Uh, and on a personal level for me, Andy has been just a phenomenal mentor uh, and friend. Uh, so that to have you here, Andy, I really appreciate that and thank you uh, for coming. I uh, also want to acknowledge a few other members uh, of McDonald's, our system. We talk about ourselves being a three-legged stool. It's not just the company employees, uh, but it's also our suppliers. Uh, it's our franchisees. And on the supplier side, I uh, want to recognize uh, Ted Perlman and Russ Smythe, uh, both uh, here for us on behalf of Javi. Javi is one of our most strategic suppliers, uh, started over 50 years uh, ago. And Ted has served in a number of capacities uh, supporting our, our system, including currently serving as uh, a, a member of the Board of Trustees, uh, Board of Directors for the Ronald McDonald House Charities, uh, which all of you are, I think, very familiar with. Speaking of Ronald McDonald House Charities, uh, I also want to thank Holly uh, Buckendahl, who's here today. Holly is the CEO of the Ronald McDonald House Charities for Chicagoland uh, and Northern Indiana. Uh, so thank you, Holly. Uh, for coming here today. And I could go on and on, but I, I would call out just three other people that are integral to uh, McDonald's, but also have played, I think, uh, a leading role in this city uh, and have certainly been uh, very helpful for me, brought more broadly, but also in thinking about uh, today's comments. And, and that would be uh, Sheila Penrose, uh, John Rogers, as well as Miles White, uh, who I think many of you uh, know here in the room. and. Um, uh, I'm very fortunate to have them uh, guiding us, not just on McDonald's as members of our board of directors, but also helping us think about Chicago and how we make it uh, a, a great place for us to all live and do business. And then finally, Mary mentioned it briefly, but uh, thank you, Mary. We do count you as a member of our McFamily from uh, Mary's time as our global CMO at McDonald's. Five years, was it, that you were at McDonald's? Yeah. So. Um, uh, just been so proud of Mary and her accomplishments, everything that she's gone on to achieve as CEO of Ulta, and now your newest gig as uh, CEO of Foot Locker. So congratulations uh, on that. So as you can tell from my introduction, the ties between McDonald's and the city of Chicago uh, run very deep. And, while others may talk about Chicago as being the second city, I think it's safe to say that for McDonald's, the city of Chicago has always been our first city. And that dates back to Ray Kroc when he founded the company. Ray Kroc opened the very first McDonald's restaurant, as many of you know, in Des Plaines, Illinois. Uh, and then Ray went on and made a point of making sure that he opened the 100th restaurant in the Chicagoland area the 1,000th restaurant in the Chicagoland area, and the 2,000th restaurant in the Chicagoland area. No coincidence uh, on that. Today, we, we operate in the Chicagoland area, we operate 400 restaurants, and we are in virtually every neighborhood across the city. We're in Little Village, we're in the Gold Coast, we're in Chatham. We're not just providing jobs, it's not just about selling burgers and fries. We do see, back to our purpose, our role to foster community across the city, to create opportunities for our citizens, to provide them economic mobility, to provide them training. McDonald's is so much more than just a burger institution. The impact that we have, I think, extends far and wide. When you think about the 400 restaurants that we have, we've, ex we've spent about $20 million in the last few years renovating those restaurants in the Chicagoland area. When we spend those $20 million to renovate the restaurants in Chicagoland, we're providing jobs to contractors, to electricians, to plumbers. All of those have an impact. We also, as a global business, we have about 5,000 franchisees across the globe. We have a similar number of suppliers across the globe. All of them come to Chicago to visit our headquarters. And when they do, they're staying in Chicago restaurants, they're staying, or they're staying in Chicago hotels, they're eating at Chicago restaurants, they're shopping in Chicago stores. If you're looking for evidence of what the McDonald's money multiplier effect is, just look at what's happening in the West Loop. We went into the West Loop in 2018, 
And I think it's safe to say that the West Loop is booming, and we certainly believe that we've been an important catalyst of that. That is with the power of McDonald's in the city uh, of Chicago. Beyond just the business side, we have thousands of employees who are headquartered here in Chicago, and they volunteer in charities across, all this, across the city. Uh, many of those charities are here today. We serve on boards, we're volunteering our time, and they're also giving up uh, corporate giving and supporting, and we do have a matching program at McDonald's where we're making sure that all of our employee contributions to charities across the city, that we're matching that dollar for dollar. The corporate level, our philanthropy in the city, I think, is well known, well established. We just point out that that number continues to increase every single year. And so as others are looking for maybe places to cut back, our charitable giving to the city is increasing. Most recently, we just announced $3.5 million that we're going to be investing through the Chicago Community Trust in about 40 neighborhood organizations to provide life skills training and employment support to Chicago youth, primarily Chicago youth that are from the city's black and Latino communities. And I want to recognize just a few of the recipients of that support uh, who are here with us today, the Chicago Urban League, Hope Chicago, and the Association, Association House. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing uh, to make this city a better place and for the hard work there. So I appreciate that. When you add it all up, the Chicago McDonald's annual economic contribution to the city of Chicago exceeds $2 billion a year. $2 billion a year is the economic contribution of having McDonald's headquarters here. And to sharpen that in a different way, think about what if McDonald's wasn't here? It would be $2 billion that left the city overnight in one year, and the impact of that would be the tax base would erode, would see public and private institutions that would weaken, and the dyna dynamism and the confidence that I think define this city, they most certainly would suffer, suffer. Can you imagine Chicago without McDonald's? I cannot. But we also need to face facts, and the facts haven't been especially kind to the city of Chicago of late. The fact is that there are fewer large companies headquartered in Chicago this year than last year. There are fewer this month than last month. Now, I've heard some people discount the significance of Boeing's departure, Caterpillar's departure, Citadel's departure. It's not that many jobs. They weren't going to maintain a presence here anyway, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe so, but I think we can all agree their departure is not good news for our city. Given the nature of my job, I travel around the US, I travel around the world, and everywhere I go, I'm confronted by the same question these days. What's going on in Chicago? While it may wound our civic pride to hear it, there is a general sense out there that our city is in crisis. The truth is, it's more difficult today for me to convince a promising McDonald's executive to relocate to Chicago from one of our other offices than it was just a few years ago. Truth is, it's more difficult for me to recruit a new employee to McDonald's to join us in Chicago than it was in the past. Now, I'm probably the biggest ambassador that you'll find for the city of Chicago. It's my family's home. I love Chicago. So when I get that, I extol the virtues of the city. I talk about the wonders of our lakefront, our incredible cultural institutions, our world-class health care, our leading institutions of higher education, our relatively low cost of living, the incredible diversity of our city, and our phenomenal culinary scene. I even talk up the bears. <laughs> it's the beginning of the season. We can be optimists. <laughs> yeah. Point is, though, it shouldn't be this hard. It shouldn't be this hard for us to talk about the positive aspects of the city. And I'll tell you, quite honestly and transparently, others do sense our vulnerability. I've heard from the mayors 
and governors who have made their case to me for McDonald's to relocate our headquarters to their city and their state. And if I'm getting those calls, you can be sure that there are other people in this room who are getting those same calls. We're one Crane's news alert away from having yet another troubling headline. Those are the facts, whether we want to know it or not, what's going on in our city right now. But while others are leaving Chicago and Illinois, I will tell you McDonald's is doubling down. We're going to be here. As you know, a few years ago, we decided to move our headquarters out of Oak Brook. And I can tell you, it was not a foregone conclusion that we would move to Chicago or even stay in the state of Illinois. But we did. And it's been a very good thing for McDonald's, for the city, and for the state. Today, we're announcing that we're relocating our innovation center from Romeoville to our West Loop headquarters. That's over 100 jobs. It's over 100 jobs that we're bringing to Chicago. Our innovation center, which we will now call Speedy Labs, for those of you who know the history of McDonald's, you'll remember Speedy. If you don't know what that means, just go watch the founder. <laughs> Speedy Labs is where we'll envision the future of McDonald's. And that work is going to happen right here in downtown Chicago. Make no mistake, though, McDonald's commitment to the city of Chicago isn't corporate altruism. It's not open-ended. It's not unconditional. As a publicly traded company, our shareholders wouldn't tolerate that. They wouldn't support that. We're betting on Chicago in the long term because we think it makes good business sense for our company, for our shareholders, for all of our stakeholders. In essence, in making that bet, we're betting on all of you, because all of you represent the city of Chicago. Public and private leaders who are passionate about this city and have a dedication and a sense of commitment to making it better. So how are we going to do that? What's it going to take? I've heard a lot of good ideas, including from the Civic Committee and many of you that I've talked to prior to today's speech. And I certainly don't have all or even most of the answers. But in my conversations with the leaders across the city, I have heard an underlying theme. It starts with partnership. We need to rejuvenate the sense of partnership, private and public partnership, that has defined Chicago for centuries. This is in our DNA. But there is a general sense right now that we've lost some of that in the past few years. Maybe it was a casualty of COVID, the disruption caused by, by the pandemic. It doesn't really matter why, but we need to get it back. 150 years ago, this city burned to the ground. 18,000 buildings were destroyed along with the homes of 100,000 Chicagoans. We all know it now as the Great Chicago Fire. A relief committee was established to provide immediate aid to the displaced and unemployed. The committee was comprised of public and private leaders who came together to fund the restoration, the reconstruction of this city, to enact new building codes, to reform the fire department. Imagine if we could form that kind of relief committee today. What should they focus on? What would be the priorities? I think what we've all talked about and what I've heard, certainly heard from you is there are three areas that we need to focus on as a city. The first is crime. I don't have to tell you why this matters. You all recognize and understand the statistics. All of us, every single person in this room, has seen the corrosive effect that crime can have on the city, its psyche, and its citizens. For many Chicago neighborhoods, this is not a new issue. But it's seeping into every corner of our city, wrecking an untold human impact. I know this issue has the full attention of our public leaders, but we all have a vested interest to better understand the plan so we can support it. Let us know the plan so we can support it. That's going to take partnership. 
The second is issue is the overall business climate. It has become increasingly difficult to operate a global business out of the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. According to the Nonpartisan Tax Foundation, Illinois now ranks 36th out of 50 states for favorable business tax climate. We also need more investment in infrastructure, both the hard and soft assets that attract new businesses. Better roads, rail, air transport. We need improved schools and a plan to help remediate the learning loss that occurred during COVID. We need to fix the business climate, and that's going to come through partnership, public and private partnership. The final issue that I would propose we work on is mindset. We need a mindset shift. We're playing defense when we need to be playing offense. Yes, Chicago has issues, and we need to address them. But by the way, so does every other major city across this country. Chicago is an incredible city, and we need to celebrate its virtues. We need to find ways to tell our story in a more compelling way. We need people to associate Chicago with growth, innovation, opportunity. We need to showcase all the proof points of that that happen all around us in this city every single day. This isn't just the job of Choose Chicago, the Economic Club, or the Chamber of Commerce. This is all of our jobs working in partnership. So in closing, let me just offer a few final thoughts. You know, Ray Kroc, when he founded McDonald's, he did so at an age where many of us would be already planning for our retirement. Ray wasn't planning for retirement when he founded McDonald's. He still harbored big dreams. And several years later, somebody asked him, what was the inspiration for you to found McDonald's? Why were you dreaming so big? Why did you take the risk that you did to start a burger company? And not just a burger company, but to start a whole new way of business, a business based on franchising that had real estate at, it, at its root. And Ray said something that I think has a lot of relevance today. He said, I was convinced the best was ahead of me. That's our opportunity here as leaders of Chicago to believe our best days are ahead of us, and to work together in partnership to ensure the vitality and success of this city for generations to come. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, there's several topics I want to cover with Chris. We have about 30 minutes, so I, I probably will have to skate through a few. But I just want to start by saying one thing. I'm also from Chicago, right? You know, I'm, I was born mm -hmm. on the south side of Chicago. Even the company I run today, while headquartered in New York, I'm not leaving Chicago. And we have 75 stores, footlocker stores, and more to come in communities that need jobs. And I have to say that this topic is one I have a lot of cognitive dissonance about because it is true, it's, it's, there's challenges. But what I'm so thrilled about what you just said is let's play offense. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I feel we as business leaders need to think about this, is that we really, you know, we need to positively build, address what the challenges are, but also, you know, build the right environment and be proud of it. So Absolutely. I just wanted to editorialize there and say thank yeah. you for your comments. Well, I, I just would add fantastic. on that real quickly because it's a lot of times easy to say, well, that's just perception, that's not reality. In our business, other people's perception becomes our reality. So when that is the perception out there, I have yeah. to act, we have to act like it is the reality, whether we agree with it or not. So I completely I, agree with you. I agree, and, and one of the things I was gonna start with, you said this in your comments, as we travel around the world in different business circles, this comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. And so we can't, you know, we can't ignore the fact that it hurts the reputation, and we've gotta both help fix what's happening, but also be ambassadors for the reputation. So let's just kind of start, stay on this topic for a little bit, the state of the city, and then there's other places I wanna take us, if that's okay. Um, but you know, McDonald's obviously has one of the largest footprints in business in the city, right? You're in all the communities, as you mentioned, your headquarters. Can you just unpack a little bit more about the, what has been the impact on your employees with the crime situation, both the reality and the perceptions of it? So whether it's your, your employees, your customers, your franchisee partners, is there more you can tell yeah. about how that's affected the business today? Well, I want to start with where our business is, which is in the store. Um, and as I mentioned, we have 400 restaurants across the city uh, employing uh, tens of thousands of people. And it's felt most significantly every single day in the restaurants. Um, and it's felt in a number of different ways. It's felt with, uh, certainly we have uh, violent crime that's happening in our restaurants. 
Uh, it's happening with homelessness, where we're seeing homelessness issues in our restaurants. Uh, we're having drug overdoses that are happening in our restaurants. So we see in our restaurants every single day what's happening in, in society at large. And that's one of the things that, about McDonald's is whatever's happening in society, good or bad, you can be sure it's happening at McDonald's. So we're seeing in a very tangible way right now what's going on in the city. It's happening day in and day out in our restaurants. On the corporate side, where it comes up, I talked about when it comes up around recruiting and relocations and some of those other things, but uh, one of the things right now that I'm trying to do, as is almost every other CEO, is get employees back into the office. <laughs> Take some cajoling. Let me know if you have any ideas or tips on how to do it. But one of the things that I hear from our employees about maybe reluctance to come back to the office is, well, I'm not sure it's safe to come downtown. I'm not sure it's safe to go ride the public transportation. I'm reading about these things that are going on out there. So it, it just shows up in so many different ways. And that's the thing about crime. It's not like you can just isolate it to one thing. Crime becomes pervasive in, in people's psyche. And it just it affects us. Um, and it's, it, ultimately, it is holding all of us back from being able to lean in and invest and go drive our business to grow drive our city. Right, and, and maybe staying on that, if we just go and click closer, you had a couple of very unfortunate things, really tragic things that have happened at McDonald's. There's one, a murder, a couple of murders yep. in Chicago and States, another restaurant on the south side, and I think that required the stores being closed for some period of time. But tell us what you learned about managing through that specific, really yep. tragic set of circumstances. So I think what I said earlier, which is what happens in the city of Chicago will happen at McDonald's. Um, but we didn't want to close those restaurants down, um, to be clear. We did not want to close those restaurants down. And the benefit of McDonald's and what we see is the worst thing to have happen would be for McDonald's when the trouble starts happening into a neighborhood for us to start backing out, to start closing restaurants. Because when we pull out, it's what I talked about, the money multiplier effect. What you're really pulling out is you're pulling out jobs, you're pulling out opportunity, you're pulling out structure, all those things that, an, that a community needs for it to operate. Um, we need to be able to keep those restaurants and able to operate those, but it goes back to we need partnership. And so when we had the very unfortunate incident that you talked about uh, at Chicago and State, and I want to thank Jack and, and the Chicago Chamber, um, we had to have some conversations with city leaders about what was needed for us to be able to operate those restaurants. And uh, it's not going to be something that McDonald's can solve on its own. We need to be able to do it with, with uh, public sector support as well. So that, that for me is uh, you know, ultimately where we need to be able to get these things is how do we come together as the city, come together as private companies, and make sure that it's safe for us to be able to do business in these communities, because that's how you ultimately create the mobility and create the, the support for these to be safer. Right, and, and I guess if I recap, and we'll move on to other topics, but from the comments that you made, I took three big things. One is commitment to our great city. Mm -hmm. Secondly is public-private partnership, and third is playing offense. Mm -hmm. So I guess before we leave, is there anything else? Because I know there's a lot of people in this room who are working hard on these issues. And a lot of people that I've met in the business community and the civic community that believe in the public-private partnership notion and are working together. Is there anything else that you feel like this, this group of people need to leave as a call to action with? I think the biggest thing, which is what I shared in my comments, which is how many people, show of hands here, would say they know what the plan is? So exactly what are we doing? What are the metrics? How are we going to track progress? I mean, this is what you do in business mm -hmm. day in and day out. You have a plan. You have a set of metrics. You have milestones. You track progress. How are we doing on that? So I don't know. How many people here could be able to say they know what the plan is, they know what the targets are, they know the milestones? I don't think there's an awareness of that. And so if there's not an awareness of that, how can we work together to support it? For us to all work together in partnership, we all have to be on the same page and understand where we're going. And so that, for me, is the biggest thing that we need to get, is an understanding amongst every single person in this room, what exactly is the plan, how are we going to measure progress, and how do I contribute to the overall success of the plan? We don't have that today, and I think that's a good place for us to start. Fantastic. Um, let's kind of go up a notch since we're on uh, these hard topics. You know, the role of CEOs today 
is different than any other time in my career, right? I think we are in the middle of national debate on political and social issues, and the role of the CEO is, is the expectations are higher and different, right, in terms of taking stances or not taking stances, and we know how challenging it is. You know, there's national topics, voting rights, same-sex marriage, abortion rights. So how do you think about this at McDonald's? What framework do you use, Chris, when you're asked, I'm sure, by your employees yeah. uh, and customers to take stances on any number of topics? It's an incredibly complicated topic, and as you know, uh, you, you've been uh, a public company CEO. Every company and board is having this conversation. I've had this uh, discussion a number of times with our board, and, and what we've aligned on is a, is a general framework, which is, uh, think about a pyramid. At the top of the pyramid is anything that is specific to our industry, we absolutely are going to speak out on. So when there are things specific to uh, the restaurant industry that we think have an impact or where we, where we have a voice, uh, that's a no-brainer that we're going to go speak out uh, on those topics. We then have at the company four areas that we have identified as priorities where we think McDonald's can make a difference. Uh, and those four priorities are around uh, local farming. Uh, second is around creating jobs and opportunity. Third is around helping communities in crisis. And then the fourth is around uh, climate and particularly carbon emissions. Those aligned with our board are the four areas that we've prioritized as being things that we're going to make an impact on. And so any of those four topics, I would say, if we can be helpful, and that's an important screen, which is us speaking out, if we can be helpful on one of those four topics, then we'll go and speak out. The, th the third layer of this, and this is the one that's probably the most complicated one because it can easily be uh, viewed through different lenses, is about our values. And at McDonald's, we have five values. We put our people and our customers first, that we open our doors to everyone, we do the right thing, we're good neighbors, and we get better together. Those are our five values as a company. And so when we see an issue that goes and flies in the face of one of those values, where we think us speaking out on that could make a difference, that'll also be an area that we weigh in. And so we did speak out uh, quite forcefully around uh, the murder of George Floyd, uh, and what was going on during that period of time. But there were other times uh, in voting rights, as an example, where we didn't speak out. And I would just say uh, nobody is going to agree all the time with those decisions. Um, we just have to have a rationale and a logic and looked at through the lens of our values to say, uh, does this comport with what we're trying to do at McDonald's? And does, by us speaking out, do we actually think we can make a difference? It's, that's fair, fair enough, and I think good, good advice for a lot of folks thinking these things through. Um, so you are running a global corporation, and there's a lot happening around the world. And, yeah. and I, I'd be remiss to not just get your view on how you're feeling. I mean, you, the, you know, COVID restrictions in China have been a huge issue. Europe is, you know, clearly super strong headwinds right now in terms of uh, fuel inflation, not to mention inflation in the U.S., right? And then you had to make some key decisions in Russia. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know where to start, but just give us kind of a, a, a high-level view of McDonald's. Uh, what do you see as the key yeah. issues and pressures today globally? It's complicated. I know. It's complicated. <laughs> I know. And we, got, we ain't got that much time. But <laughs> um, so... Let me start with our, our Q2, we, we grew almost 10%. Uh, so our business, fortunately, is in very good shape. And the, the phenomenal thing about McDonald's uh, and what Ray Kroc created is this is an incredibly resilient business that has stood the test of time through all sorts of different economic cycles and everything else all around the world. So an incredibly resilient uh, business for us. But as you do go around the world, uh, there are challenges all over the place. Zero COVID in China is a significant challenge for us because we operate 5,500 restaurants in China. Um, and you know, we've continued to have a stop-start approach to what we're, what we're doing in those uh, restaurants. You've mentioned Russia. Uh, the U.S. has had, uh, I would say, relatively an easier time of things. But right now, I'd say the most concerning part of our global portfolio is what's happening in Europe. And specifically what's happening in Europe is we're seeing unprecedented uh, inflation around utilities. Uh, the cost of energy for running our restaurants is doubling or troubling uh, in many of our restaurants. And if you think about it, typically utilities for us, uh, if you were thinking about a restaurant P&L, is about 3% cost of sales would be utility. 
Uh, right now, it's running about 6% cost of sales, and that number is going to continue, uh, we think, to increase. So you have a significant amount of, of energy inflation. That impacts not just us, but that also impacts the European consumer. We're seeing consumer sentiment across Europe uh, is plummeting to all-time lows. It's at an all-time low right now in France. It's at an all-time low in Germany. Uh, there's a lot of concern in the UK. All of that naturally is going to work its way through the business. So I do think as I look out to 2023, I'm expecting a more challenging 2023, certainly in Europe, but I think globally. I think we are headed into probably a hopefully minor recession in the US and probably a more significant recession in Europe. Really, thank, thank you. Very helpful perspective. Um, so I, I want to learn more about you and what shaped you. Before I do that, though, because there's so many great questions I want to ask you about McDonald's and I'm sure people will be interested in. So you're a relative newbie mm -hmm. at McDonald's, right? And I give you a lot of credit for the trajectory that you've had in such a short period of time. You know, it has a, McDonald's as a company has a reputation of being having a lot of tradition. Mm -hmm. I know that. I know mm -hmm. what it was like when I became the global CMO coming from PepsiCo and Quaker. You know, I had to learn a whole new way of, of influencing and, and, and working. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was a great learning experience for me. Um, so you came in with fresh eyes and you're making some key decisions too. So talk a little bit about the, the benefits of having the perspective of kind of coming yeah. in from the outside and what some of the challenges yeah. have been. Well, I had a... Um, I guess the, the good fortune in retrospect of coming in at a time when the company wasn't doing particularly well. Back in 2015, the company wasn't doing particularly well. And one of the things that we talked about at the time was that the world uh, was moving faster outside of McDonald's than it was moving inside of McDonald's. And I think any time, and I've been in, you know, as you mentioned in the intro, a number of different companies, I think when you are, have, are a leader in your industry and as successful as McDonald's has been, that the constant thing you have to be on the watch out for is complacency. Because as a leader, you can get to be very complacent. You can start to believe your own press clippings, if you will. Uh, and so we were not uh, on our front foot as a business. And uh, that for us at the time ended up being an opportunity because when the business isn't performing well, Everybody says, well, we need to do something. We need to change. We need to actually think about things. And so I had an opportunity in the, as the head of strategy, uh, working with our CEO at the time, to rethink you know, where, where had we fallen back. And one of the things that we needed to get the facts on the table was you know, there was a lot of question about, well, is the brand as relevant today as it was maybe 20, 30 years ago? Are we losing traffic to all these fast, casual concepts, sort of the new up and coming? Uh, ideas. What we discovered is actually 70, 80 percent of our share losses were coming to our close in competitors. So we were getting beat by the people that we've been beating for decades. Um, and it's, we were getting beat because we had lost sight of value. We had lost sight of what convenience. We had gotten our restaurants to be much more complicated. So in very, very much a sense of what we did strategically was a back to basics approach. It was get back to basics on value, get back to basics on convenience. Our restaurant, particularly in the US, uh, our restaurant estate uh, was looking pretty tired and shabby. We ended up spending $9 billion uh, over the next few years updating uh, our US restaurant estate. And the business has performed uh, very well since that. And that, that for us, um, I think, is something we're now trying to carry forward, which is we certainly want to be respectful for the past. We want to make sure that we're doing all the foundation, but we also have to constantly be thinking about in the future I would just close with one thing to give you as, as evidence of that. Back in 2017, uh, we had delivery in China. We had delivery in uh, the Middle East. It was about a billion dollar business for us. Uh, we had for years said, oh, people aren't going to want delivery in the US. You know, Who wants cold french fries, <laughs> that sort of stuff? Yeah. Well, $16 billion later, turns out there's a lot of people that want delivery in the US. I had a few uh, people ask them to be delivered this afternoon at this luncheon. So yeah. just saying, we should have done that. So, so that's just a great example where we have to be willing to reconsider and, and rethink the business. And, and what was maybe true for in the past is not necessarily what's going to be true in the future. And that's mm -hmm. part of the fun part of my job is just making sure we're always reconsidering, reassessing things. And, honoring the past, but also making sure we're keeping the right. business relevant. I think what Chris just shared is a great business lesson for so many, and I've learned that when I was at McDonald's, 
around 2005, and that was just post the era of getting out of things like Chipotle and Boston Market mm -hmm. and pret a -Mager. and I'm sure many here, people here remember that. And there was a moment of kind of losing faith in what brought us to the party, mm -hmm. and that balance of being able to really protect and understand and drive your core, but also innovate. Yep. And so the innovations, I think you call it the 3Ds, mm -hmm. so delivery, uh, drive, -through. drive through, and digital. Yep. Um, clearly, that's fueling the business. So to me, that's a great example of how can you have your cake and eat it too, right? Be who you are, but also lean forward into the future. Yeah, so exactly. talk a little about, oh, go ahead. Just well, I was just going to say a third of our transactions globally now are digital. Um, so w when I say digital, it means you're either ordering through delivery, you're ordering on the, on the global mobile, our, our app, uh, or you're ordering with one of the kiosks that we have in a restaurant. A third of our uh, business is now uh, happening on digital. And what's interesting to think about is for years and years and years, the physical restaurant was the relationship that McDonald's had to the customer. And what's happening for us as a business is the physical presence, it's important, but it's less important today than it was in the past. Do you really care where your McDonald's is located if you're ordering on delivery? Location becomes a lot less relevant when you have, in some markets like the UK, delivery is 35% of the business. Your locations are less relevant there. So it's, a, it's an exciting thing for us. The other thing that's exciting for us to think about is we do about 70 million transactions a day in our restaurants. Um, each transaction that could be an individual or it could be a family, we don't know exactly, but that's the point. On all of those transactions, historically, we have only identified or known the customer in less than 10% of those transactions. They were, even if they ordered on the kiosk, we didn't necessarily know who was ordering. Um, we're on the pathway now to being able to understand and know 40% of our transactions is what we've set as our own internal goal. Um, and that opens up a whole bunch of other things now. If I know your order history, if I know what offers motivate you, which ones don't, you used to buy this, you're no longer buying this, those are all sorts of things that we can now start to think about the business. The other thing that it opens up is imagine how you run your kitchen. If I understand buying behavior, if I know that you are about to come onto our parking lot, which we know through geofencing that exists on all of our locations, then I can start to cue the kitchen and I can start to be ready so that we're putting down a burger on the grill because we know you just pulled on the lot and we know that you always order a quarter pounder. So it just, it allows you to reimagine the business in almost every dimension, which is incredibly exciting. So I think everybody is thinking how we're gonna mess you up the next time they go to the drive-thru yeah. and order something completely <laughs> different. But seriously, so I read that you're using, I mean, AI to help do predictive modeling in yeah. terms of drive-thru orders, right? So yeah, everybody is. And, and we've also got out there uh, in Kansas City, we've got about 100 restaurants today that, uh, uh, we have uh, automated order taking. So imagine a Siri or Alexa, when you pull up to the drive through it is uh, an automated order taking that's taking your order. And one of the things that you know, we're looking at and learning from is just what's the customer reaction to that. I think the thing that we have to be very careful on is that we don't get so enthralled with yeah. what technology can do that we lose sight of are we providing a good customer experience. So I'm not sure if automated order taking will take off or not, the customer will tell us, but uh, it sure is a lot of fun to play around in the Well, experiment. right, and also I think the heart of one of McDonald's uh, at roles in communities is bringing still physically people together like retirees oh, and yeah. people coming together for coffee, right? So it's yep. finding that balance. So let's go back to, you've made some, you know, not easy decisions too. So let's talk about a couple of them. First, let's, we're on menu, let's talk about menus. So, Salads, you know, we 86 the salads. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, from my restaurant days. Uh, but, you know, salads and big plant burger. Tell me about, like, yeah. that, those decisions. And, and also the Happy Meal, which I know part of, you know, sure. has been about making that healthier yeah. and, and still really attractive to kids. But talk about those decisions. Well, I get asked all the time, you know, why don't you have this on the menu anymore? Why don't you have that on the menu well, I was gonna anymore? Ask, no. <laughs> um, and what I say is we, we put on the menu what sells. So I, I have people that say- Rocket science. You know, <laughs> he didn't need AI to tell why him that. Why don't we have the egg white delight anymore on the menu? I was well, looking for that. Because you didn't buy it when we did. Uh, <laughs> so if you want it on the menu, buy it. Uh, and it's the same thing as it relates to salads and some mm -hmm. of those other things. We are bringing them back in some markets. We're not bringing them back in all markets. And yeah. A benefit, there were, there were mostly negatives out of COVID, but one of the benefits that we saw through COVID was 
We radically simplified our operations through COVID in part because we had supply chain issues, we had staffing issues. We typically reduced our menu by about 30% uh, around the world uh, during COVID. Uh, and what we discovered was a lot of the items that we got rid of that uh, somebody thought were critical, the customer didn't seem to miss. And by the way, when you got rid of all that complexity uh, in, the, in the restaurants, uh, it improved operations, it improved service times, and it improved margins. So we're gonna be judicious. We always have to find ways that we're making sure we're introducing new menu items, um, but we also don't wanna make it too complicated. If you want McPlant, I would tell you, buy McPlant. <laughs> oh, it cracked me up. It wasn't a great name. Anyways, um, one person's opinion. Yeah. So let's talk about, about, you also made decisions about how, how people can buy new franchise, mm -hmm. new franchises. And, and obviously you talked about the three-legged stool, which I remember very importantly, the, the customers, the employees, the suppliers, the franchisees. So talk about how you made a change there. And then relatedly, and you know, I, I know, you know sometimes these get bigger headlines than maybe they deserve, but there was a couple of no confidence votes yeah. that came your way so yeah. from franchise groups. Yeah. So, so tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, so, so start with how did McDonald's get started? Uh, it, it got started because Ray believed that local owner operators who were uh, in the community, in their restaurants every single day was gonna be the most effective way for us to run a restaurant and that trying to run it out of a Chicago headquarters was not gonna be the way to do this. You needed local ownership. And what Ray did is uh, he found those local entrepreneurs and Many of them started in the restaurant. Many of them were people that uh, were either working at someone else's restaurant or were working in one of uh, the early company-owned restaurants, and he made them franchisees. And fast forward to where we are today, you know, we have about 5,000 franchisees around uh, the world. In the U.S., we have about 2,000 franchisees. Our franchisees, in general, have become phenomenally successful. Uh, so the average uh, McDonald's franchisee, the equity value of their restaurants is north of $15 million. Um, they typically own about seven uh, to eight restaurants. So our franchisees have become incredibly successful, which is exactly what we want to have happen. The flip side of that, though, is now if you're trying to come into the system, if you're a crew person who's working in the restaurant today, your ability to actually dream about becoming a franchisee has become a lot harder. On a per restaurant basis, you need to have about $2.5 million as a, fran as, a, as a crew person to dream about owning one restaurant. And even if you have the most generous bank financing that BMO, I know you guys are here. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Dave, I see you. Even though I know you're super generous, you're not that generous. Um, that franchisee, that crew person is still going to need to have half a million dollars to just get one restaurant. Hmm. that's become incredibly challenging uh, for our system to be able to have people to have that dream of working their way up through the restaurant to then become franchisees and go on to have the great success. We believe that that story, that that ability for economic mobility is central to our culture. Um, it's central to what we stand for as a business. And we felt we needed to step in and so what we did is we announced last year that we would actually provide essentially free financing of up to $250 million to allow primarily crew people to become franchisees. And by the way, our crew people are... <laughs> our crew people are... Uh, Two-thirds of our uh, restaurant managers are women. Uh, the majority of our crew people are from underrepresented minorities. So when you're talking about DEI initiatives, there's probably no more compelling DEI initiative that McDonald's could do than to make sure that that pathway to financial success still exists for the crew who are in our restaurant to be able to come uh, franchise owners. Now, when you have a universe of restaurants and it is growing, but it's not growing as fast as it was back in Ray's day, we have 14,000 restaurants in the US. We typically add about 40 to 50 restaurants per year in the US. Maybe we change that and increase it a little bit, but roughly that's the number. Um, any restaurant that becomes an opportunity for someone else invariably means it's not an opportunity for someone who's already in the system. That creates a little tension. Sometimes that tension bubbles out into the public. Sometimes Cranes likes to write about those sorts of things. 
So welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about, um, we just have a few minutes left. Let's talk about the work in, you know, employees. There's obviously all, most businesses are dealing with a few factors, you know, overall shortages of, of employees. Uh, your industry in particular, there's a lot of pressure on wage and there's a growing unionization effort. Mm -hmm. I know you're fully aware of that. So can you just, in a couple of minutes, kind of talk about how you're managing those issues for McDonald's? It starts with, if we're doing right by the crew people working in our restaurant, if we're providing them with the training they need, the flexibility that they're looking for, uh, competitive compensation, uh, then there's no issue. Um, because people, uh, you know, believe in McDonald's and, and believe in what we're doing. We see, and one of the things we track, this is a phenomenal business. If you love data, the amount of data that we have in our restaurants is incredible. And we know that when we don't take care of the people in the restaurants, the crew people working, we tend to run, uh, the restaurants don't run as well. So it starts with, let's just make sure, and it's, it's make sure our, primarily our franchisees are doing the right things to take care of their crew uh, we announced at the, at the company level, and then our franchisees followed suit, um, but average wages are up significantly uh, on an hourly basis in the U.S. I think our U.S. average, we have our U.S. Uh, CHRO who's here today, Tiffany Boyd. Um, but, you know, we are, if seven and a quarter is the national average or is the national minimum wage, I will tell you we are multiple dollars uh, ahead of that. I think probably 12 $13 uh, an hour is around what the, the national starting wage uh, would be for us. And the thing with our restaurants is if you stay with a restaurant, typically we see most of the turnover happen in the first 90 days. If you're in our business, then what happens is after 90 days, you start to have pretty rapid escalation of compensation on an hourly wage rate because we know that that person's actually willing and committed to having a career at McDonald's. So, for us, it's about making sure that we're taking care of our crew, making, taking care of our customers. The other thing I would tell you is, and this is where, you know, I think we need to do a better job of ed educating policymakers. California just introduced a piece of legislation called AB 257, uh, which from our vantage point was uh, a terrible piece of policy because what it said was it said that uh, the governor is now going to appoint 11 people who are going to decide on behalf of the fast food industry uh, what the hourly wage rates needs to be, and is going to decide on work schedules, is going to de decide on uh, benefits, training, all those sorts of things. That's going to be decided by an appointed group by the governor uh, who's going to run the industry. And by the way, it only applies to restaurants who have 100 restaurants or more. And P.S., if you bake bread in that restaurant, you're exempted as well. Sounds like so, we need to start baking bread at McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, our position on that that we talked about uh, quite, you know, aggressively with the, the, the governor but also the state assembly is we're all for doing that. If you want to, if that's, if you believe that it's important to move to, they wanted to move to $23 an hour in California, shouldn't that apply to everybody? So shouldn't that apply to every single restaurant if you believe that you need to have safety standards in restaurant that apply, shouldn't that apply to every restaurant worker and not just the restaurant workers who are in bigger restaurants? So those are the sorts of things that we need to do a better job as a company of educating and it gets lost in some of the discussion about, you know, fight for labor and whatever and as you can probably guess, uh, labor's got a pretty aggressive uh, checkbook and policy position in California. Um, so. We're going to take that to that other McDonald's states. Do you think that McDonald's will be able to stay competitive nationally on wages? How do you think about that? Our, our view is so long as it's a level playing field, we'll always be fine. I mean, there are places around the world where we're already paying $22 or $23. Uh, Singapore, parts of Switzerland, we're already paying $22 or $23. What doesn't work for McDonald's is when McDonald's is held to a different standard mm -hmm. than everybody else is in the restaurant industry. That's when we start to have a problem. And, our, our point is just give us a level playing field and don't try to pick winners and losers. Let the customer and the experience that you're providing, let that determine who's successful, not have it be by an unelected group of uh, people appointed by the governor. 
besides that. Uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit. We don't have a lot of time. Chris, I'd be remiss to not ask you a little bit about yourself personally. Yep. I usually start there, but you know, we had so many meaty topics. But listen, one of the things I admire about you is as I've read things and heard you speak, that you're open you know, focus on values, whether it's your family, your faith, you know, how you, your family, your parents, you know, talk a little bit about just at a macro level, what are the things that have shaped you as a leader? Mm -hmm. I think um, for me, certainly my upbringing and my parents, um, you know, was a, was a really important part of instilling those values. I grew up in a very Catholic household, uh, and for those Catholics in the audience, you know exactly what that means, <laughs> which is, was strict. Uh, and uh, I was an altar boy for seven years, not because I wanted to be an altar boy for seven years, but because my mom said I was going to be an altar boy. Uh, so, so I was out there doing all that stuff, but along the way, you actually pick up on a lot of these things uh, about values, accountability, uh, what's important. Um, and, and so for me, that was a great foundation. And... I think as I've gone through my career, we all get influenced by leaders. And there are a set of leaders that I have gravitated over the years. And as I've reflected on, you know, why did I get inspired by them? It's because I actually, I believed in them. And why did I believe in them? Well, I believed in them because I actually thought their heart was in the right place, that they were about supporting other people, that they were about being fairness. I mean, that's, when you think about the people you respect, the values is more often than not the reason that you respect them. And so for me, it came back to, I'd love to be that type of leader. And for me to be that type of leader, I need to role model, I need to espouse a set of values that hopefully attract and inspire other people. And so that's why I've tried to make it a centerpiece of, of what I'm all about. That's fantastic. Well, um, I have just a few little questions to learn more about you. You ready? I'm ready. Little, just a quick lightning rod. I promise we'll get out of here soon. I think I know the answer to this, but your favorite McDonald's menu item? Breakfast or lunch. Uh, breakfast? Let's, well, I know you eat three meals a day there. Yeah, egg that, McMuffin, so. no, no bacon. No bacon, but not the uh, egg white delight thing. Oh, that's gone. Okay. It used Fine. to be. Uh, all right. <laughs> See? You should have bought more. Okay. I know. I, Exhibit A. I thought I was right. doing my part. I uh, wasn't doing fish enough. Fillet, fish fillet, no fillet tartar fish, sauce. Fillet of fish, no tartar. Fillet of fish. Yeah, okay. double ketchup. Okay, perfect. Um, hey, what's, what's something that, that not only a lot of people know about you? Boy, one thing, <laughs> uh, a lot of, not a lot of people know about me. Uh, I'm a huge sports fan. Uh, I'm not good at any of them, but uh, <laughs> I, I know I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you on almost any uh, sports thing. The other thing is I'm a, I'm a big tabloid reader, so <laughs> Daily Mail. I mean, it's usually in the morning, it's like Daily Mail and ESPN, and then I'm ready I to go. I love that. You know, yeah. I... I understand, because I feel like in our jobs, we need to know what's happening in popular culture. Yeah, That's absolutely. the rationale I use if somebody catches no, me reading My, my DVR is set magazine. for the Queen's funeral on the 19th. So this, this, this might answer, if you have an extra 15 minutes a day, what would, you, like, what would you do if you had 15 extra minutes a day, besides a Daily Mail? I, I do think um, th that too often what ends up happening is uh, you, you sometimes shortchange time with family. So if I had 15 extra minutes, it would be to just spend that extra moment with you know, my son or daughter or with my wife. Because uh, they, more often than not, when you're looking to cut quarters somewhere and you're saying, I need to go do this, I need to go th do that, more often than not, where you cut the corners with the family. So I'd, I owe them 15 minutes back. I like that. And by the way, did your kids have a choice about where they went to college? I'm just curious, this whole Duke no. thing. OK. I, yeah. My wife also went to Duke. So he already no. told me that. I yeah. said, I have four kids. None of them were as compliant to, to follow my orders yeah. as yours apparently it's are. It's called power so. of the purse. Power of the purse. OK. <laughs> well, I have one last question. I have something I need somebody to grab for me, if you don't mind. Uh, there's a, a, a really important question. I heard you like to run. I do. So, what's yes. your favorite running shoe? Because I, I, well, okay, shameless, oh, shameless wow. self, shameless wow. self promotion. Now, okay. a little, a little bird told me. I know that's really. I'm well, sorry, I'm very to David. Well, I'm particular about my running shoe. I know. I hope this is. Uh, and it's, it's. I only wear Nikes. Is this the right Nikes. brand? At least, yeah, it's, okay. It's Nikes. We're, I feel and, like we're doing like a. Okay, and yeah, then. And I usually like the the. They've got this sort of next percent, which is the super cushiony soles. Okay, I think um, we're. I think we're oh, on the yeah, right track somebody here. Somebody okay. advised you so, well. Yeah. So yes. this is just a little thank you to you, yeah, Chris. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you so much. All right.